Okay, this um, we're going to read chapter five, um, and it's called "Back on This Side of the Door." I feel like I've read this about four times because I've done it in bits for the guided reading and for the um, English. Um, anyway, so back on this side of the door. Because the game of hide and seek was still going on, it took Edmund and Lucy some time to find the others. But when at last they were all together, which had happened in the long room where the suit of armour was, Lucy burst out, Peter, Susan, it's all true. Edmund has seen it too. There is a, there is a country you can get through the wardrobe. Edmund and I both got in. Go on, Edmund, tell them all about it. What's all this all about, Ed? said Peter. And now we come to one of the nastiest things in this story. Up to that moment, Edmund had been feeling sick and sulky and annoyed with Lucy for being right, but he hadn't made up his mind what to do. When Peter suddenly asked the question, he decided at once to do the meanest, most spiteful thing he could think of. He decided to let Lucy down. Tell us, Ed, said Susan. And Edmund gave a very superior look as if he were far older than Lucy. There really was only one year's difference between them. And then a little snigger and said, Oh yes, Lucy and I have been playing, pretending all her story about a country in the wardrobe is true. Just for fun, of course. There's nothing there, really. Poor Lucy gave Edmund one look and rushed out of the room. Edmund, who was becoming a nastier person every minute, thought that he had scored a great success and went on at once to say, There she goes again. What's the matter with her? That's the worst of young kids. They always... Look here, said Peter, turning on him savagely. Shut up. You've been perfectly beastly to Lou ever since she started this nonsense about the wardrobe. And now you go playing games with her about it and setting her off again. I believe you did it simply out of spite. But it's all nonsense, said Edmund, very taken aback. Of course it's all nonsense, said Peter. That's just the point. Lou was perfectly all right when we left home, but since we've been down here, she seems to be either going queer in the head or turning into a most frightful liar. But whichever it is, what good do you think you'll do by jeering and nagging at her one day and encouraging her the next? I thought, I thought, said Edmund, but he couldn't think of anything to say. You didn't think anything at all, Peter said. It's just spite. You've always liked being beastly to Lou. Uh, and to anyone smaller than yourself. We've seen that at school before now. Do stop it, said Susan. It won't make things any better having a row between you two. Let's go and find Lucy. It was not surprising that when they found Lucy, a good deal later, everyone could see that she had been crying. Nothing they could say to her made any difference. She stuck to her story and said, I don't care what you think, and I don't care what you say. You can tell the professor, or you can write to mother, or you can do anything you like. I know I've met a fawn in there, and I wish I'd stayed there, and you are all beasts. Beasts. It was an unpleasant evening. Lucy was miserable, and Edmund was be beginning to feel that his plan wasn't working as well as he had expected. The two older ones were really beginning to think that Lucy was out of her mind. They stood in the passage talking about it in whispers long after she had gone to bed. The result, then was, the result was the next morning they decided that they really would go and tell the whole thing to the professor. He'll write to father if he thinks there's really something wrong with Lou, said Peter. It's getting beyond us. So they went and knocked at the study door and the professor said, come in and got up and found chairs for them, and said he was quite at their disposal. Then he sat listening to them with the tips of his fingers pressed together, and never interrupting till they had finished the whole story. After that, he said nothing for quite a long time. Then he cleared his throat and said the last thing either of them had expected. How do you know, he asked, that your sister's story is not true? Oh, but, began Susan, and then stopped. Anyone could see from the old man's face that he was perfectly serious. Then Susan pulled herself together and said, But Edmund said they had only been pretending. 
That is a point, said the Professor, which certainly deserves consideration. Very careful consideration. For instance, if you will excuse me for asking the question, does your experience lead you to regard your brother or your sister as the most reliable? I mean, which is more truthful? That's just the funny thing about it, sir, said Peter. Up till now, I'd have said Lucy every time. And what do you think, my dear, said the professor, turning to Susan. Well, said Susan, in general, I'd say the same as Peter. But this couldn't be true, all this about the wood and the fawn. That is more than I know, said the professor. And a charge of lying against someone whom you have always found truthful is a very serious thing, a very serious thing indeed. We were afraid it mightn't even be lying, said Susan. We thought there might be something wrong with Lucy. Madness, you mean, said the professor, quite coolly. Oh, you can make your minds, e make your minds easy about that. One has to only look at her and talk to her to see that she is not mad. But then, said Susan, and stopped. She had never dreamed that a grown-up would talk like the professor and didn't know what to think. Logic, said the professor, half to himself. Why don't they teach logic at these schools? There are only three possibilities. Either your sister is telling lies, or she is mad, or she is telling the truth. You know she doesn't tell lies, and it is obvious that she is not mad. For the moment, then, and unless any further evidence turns up, we must assume that she is telling the truth. Susan looked at him very hard, and was quite sure from the expression on his face that he was not making fun of them. But how could it be true, sir? said Peter. Why do you say that? asked the professor. Well, for one thing, said Peter, if it was real, why doesn't everyone find this country every time they go into the wardrobe? I mean, there was nothing there when we looked. Even Lucy didn't pretend there was. What has that got to do with it? said the professor. Well, sir, if things are real, they're there all the time. Are they? said the professor. And Peter did not quite, didn't not know quite what to say. But there was no time, said Susan. Lucy had no time to have gone anywhere, even if there was such a place. She came running after us the very moment we were out of the room. It was less than a minute, and she pretended to have been away for hours. That is the very thing that makes her story so likely to be true, said the professor. If there really is a door in this house that leads somewhat to some other world, and I should warn you that this is a very strange house, and even I know very little about it. If, I say, she had got into another world, I should not be at all surprised to find that the other world had a separate time of its own, so that however long you stayed there, it would never take up any of our time. On the other hand, I don't think many girls of her age would invent that idea for themselves, that if she had been pretending, she would have hidden for a reasonable time before coming out and telling her story. But do you really mean, sir, said Peter, that there could be other worlds all over the place, just around the corner like that? Nothing is more probable, said the professor, taking off his spectacles and beginning to polish them, while he muttered to himself. I wonder what they do teach the them at schools. But what are we to do, said Susan? She felt that the conversation was beginning to get off the point. My dear young lady, said the professor, suddenly looking up with a sharp expression at the both of them. There is one, there is one plan which no one has yet suggested and which is well worth trying. What's that, said Susan. We might all try minding our own business, said he. And that was the end of the conversation. After this, things were a good deal better for Lucy. Peter saw to it that Edmund stopped jeering at her and neither she nor anyone else felt inclined to talk about the wardrobe at all. It had become ra a rather an it had become a rather alarming subject, and so for the time it looked as if all adventures were coming to an end. But that was not to be. This house of the professors, which even he knew little about, was so old and famous that people from all over England used to come and ask permission to see over it. It was the sort of house that is mentioned in guidebooks and even in histories. And well, it might be, for all manner of stories were told about it, some of them even stranger than the one I am telling you now. 
and parties of sightseers arrived and asked to see the house. And when parties of sightseers arrived and asked to see the house, the professor always gave them permission, and Mrs MacReady, the housekeeper, showed them round, telling them about pictures and the armour and the rare books in the library. Mrs MacReady was not fond of children and did not like to be interrupted when she was telling visitors all the things she knew. She had said to Susan and Peter almost the on the first morning, along with a good many other instructions, and please remember you are to keep out of the way whenever I am taking a party over the house. Just as any of us would what just as if any of us would want to waste half the morning trailing around with a crowd of strange grown ups, said Edmund, and the other three thought the same. That was how the adventures began for the third time. A few mornings later, Peter and Edmund were looking at the suit of armour and wondering if they could take it to bits when the two girls rushed into the room and said, Look out! Here comes the MacReady and the whole gang with her. Sharp's the word, said Pete. Uh, Sharp's the word. And Peter and all and all four made, it, made off through the door at the far end of the room. But when they had got into the green room and beyond it into the library, they suddenly heard voices ahead of them and realising that Mrs MacReady must be bringing her party of sightseers up the back stairs instead of up the front stairs as they had expected. After that, whether it was that they lost their heads or that Mrs MacReady was trying to catch them or that some magic in the house had come to life and was chasing them into Narnia, they seemed to find themselves being followed everywhere until at last Susan said, "'I'll bother those trippers.' Here, let's go into the wardrobe room they've, till they've passed. No one will follow us there. But the moment they were inside, they heard voices in the passage, and then someone fumbling at the door. And then they saw the handle turning. Quick, said Peter, there's nowhere else. And flung, the, flung open the wardrobe. All four of them bundled inside and sat there, panting in the dark. Peter held the door closed but did not shut it, for of course he remembered, as every sensible person does, that you should never, never shut yourself up in a wardrobe.